Hello, welcome to this lesson on separation of mixtures. To begin, what is the difference between a mixture and a compound? Mixtures are only physically combined. Multiple components kind of just in the same place at the same time. So for that reason, it only takes a physical change in order to separate the components of a mixture. Depending on the components of the mixture, you're gonna use a different means to separate those components. So we would use a distillation if we were separating homogeneous liquids. That would be something like water and alcohol. Those two liquids mix very well, so the resulting mixture is homogeneous. You can't visually see where the water is and where the alcohol is. Because these two liquids have two different boiling points, we would distill them. What happens is our mixture goes into this boiling flask and it is heated usually by a Bunsen burner, but you could also do this with a hot plate. Whichever of the two liquids boils first is going to begin to evaporate as seen here. You'll be able to tell which is evaporating based on the temperature because um, temperature doesn't change during a phase change. So I believe rubbing alcohol evaporates at 78 Celsius and water is 100 Celsius. I know water is 100. I'm not sure on the alcohol, but let's just say it's 78. You would heat this mixture until the mixture itself was 78 degrees Celsius. And then what would happen is that the alcohol would begin to boil. It's not yet hot enough for water to boil. So only alcohol would be boiling at this point. It would rise, hit the thermometer, tell you you're at 78. So you know that the alcohol is boiling. And then the gas or the vapor would travel through this tube and into what we call the condensing tube. The condensing tube is a tube within a tube. So you have this outer donut, which you would circulate cold water through. Cold water goes in the bottom and then it's going to wind up warming up as it's circulating around this gas and it will come out the top of the tube. This is just connected to the faucet and this is going down the sink drain. And it is going to cool this area where the alcohol vapor is. As it cools the vapor, the vapor will condense back to a liquid and then it will drip out of the condensing tube into a new container. The water will be left behind in the boiling flask and once all of the alcohol has completed boiling, the temperature will then begin to rise again. So that's how you know when all of the alcohol has been removed and is moved out to the um, receiving flask. If you learned separation of mixtures in middle school, you probably didn't learn this technique. This is called a precipitation. And here you are going to have uh, actually a chemical reaction, not usually <laughs> used for um, separating components that you want to keep in their original form. This is going to force one of the components of, of the mixture, excuse me, to bond to something else usually so that you can get it out. In this case, you have two solutions with different substances dissolved in them. And they start off as homogeneous mixtures. And then what's going to happen is they are going to be put in the same place at the same time. You're going to make this mixture. And when that happens, the ions are going to swap partners in a double replacement reaction and grab onto a component from the other mixture. So if you remember in a double replacement reaction, you have component AB and then CD. In that case, they're gonna swap partners. So A will no longer be bonded to B, it would instead be bonded to D. When this happens, either AD or CB is going to be insoluble, meaning that it's gonna form a solid and sink to the bottom of this container. Typically, we are going to strategically choose our chemicals that we want to react because the idea is that we want to pull one of these ions out of their solution, and we're going to do that by bonding it to something else. Evaporation is how you would separate salt and water. In this case, the salt is dissolved in water, but once all of that water evaporates out, the salt will be left behind. A lot of the time we do that in an evaporation. You can speed up an evaporation by using a hot plate, or in this case, using a Bunsen burner, but sometimes we just let our stuff sit out on the lab counter to evaporate out water. Um, not super often because we're kind of in a rush. It takes a long time for water to evaporate, especially it depends on like the amount of water. If you just have a salt that's maybe a little damp, sure, just let it dry out. 
But if you have a salt that's dissolved in water, you really want to heat it up and get that water out because it could take weeks for that water to evaporate on its own. Um, so this is going to just dissolve up. Something that was dissolved can only be undissolved if you remove the water. So a quick way to do that is evaporation. Now, if you remember back from bonding, ionic compounds have very, very, very high melting points. So <laughs> the water evaporates far before you run the risk of burning your ionic salt. If this were sugar, it's a different story. Sugar has a very low melting point, so you'd actually probably burn or cook the sugar very close to the temperature at which you would evaporate the water. So this is not always an option, like in the real world, but in chemistry, it's an option a lot of the time. Chromatography is a lot of fun. Um, we don't use it all that often in chemistry, aside from just colored markers and kind of just testing how a chromatography works. Um, but typically what's going to happen is that you're going to be separating things into colors. The prefix chroma means color. And a lot of the time this will be the green pigment from chlorophyll. It could be, I don't know the name of the orange in carrots. Is that beta carotene? Um, there's a lot of natural pigments, but you could also do this with inorganic, um, like man-made pigments, like inks and dyes, especially those in washable Crayola markers. That's the most common use of chromatography in a high school chemistry lab. What happens is, um, you have usually water, but you can put lots of different solvents down here. This right here represents a dot of black ink. And then the, the um, water climbs up this piece of paper, kind of like um, a paper towel. If you put a paper towel in a puddle and you can see the water climb up the paper towel, especially if you have nice paper towels, it climbs into all the little grooves. Uh, what's going to happen is that the water is going to continue climbing up this sheet of paper. And as that happens, different um, components of the ink are going to separate out. And they separate based on their polarity. So in this case, the yellow really doesn't like to hang out with the water. That's why it got stuck to the paper very quickly. Red, on the other hand, loved hanging out with the water. So it must be polar. And the, or at least more polar than these other molecules. But what happened is it stuck with water as it climbed up the paper. So that's the way a chromatography works. Again, you can use different solvents here, um, but for the sake of high school chemistry, it's probably water and it's probably ink from a magic marker. <laughs> a separatory funnel is not something you often see in a high school chemistry lab, but if you go to pursue chemistry or even nursing, and you have to take an organic chemistry class, you will definitely come <laughs> in contact with a separatory funnel. In a separatory funnel, you would have two heterogeneous liquids, something like oil and water. In this case, the oil is going to sit on the top of the water inside the separatory funnel, and the water will sink to the bottom. The reason they don't mix is because they have different polarities. The reason the oil is on top is because the oil is less dense. You would open the funnel down at the bottom. There's a little faucet kind of on the bottom and you would drip out probably 95-ish percent of this water. Then you would close the spout and you would push this very skinny, tall beaker, almost looking like a graduated cylinder, off to the side. And then you would take a waste beaker and kind of catch the place where the water and the oil are touching because it's really hard to get that to be just oil or just water. You kind of catch where they meet. And then once you're streaming all oil, you close it up again, throw that second beaker out. It's full of a mixture of oil and water, kind of junky. And then you would finish off opening and draining the rest of the oil, or you could open up the top and run it out the top. Either way, this is a really easy way to separate heterogeneous liquids. Sometimes you may hear your teacher speak of decanting. And in that case, it really just means that you're pouring the oil off of the top. Sometimes you would use a pipette to grab it very quickly and easily. Um, I don't like that when you have giant samples because it gets kind of tough. Also, it's not as um, smooth as a separatory funnel just because you run the risk of kind of shaking the two and sort of mixing them up as you pour. The separatory funnel, you can see it's in the ring stand, it's kind of held in place. And as long as you don't run too quickly, everything runs down the funnel nice and smooth. You would do a filtration anytime you have a solid mixed in with a liquid. So this could be sand and water, 
This could be even coffee grounds and water. <laughs> um, what's gonna happen is that you have a funnel and it's going to be lined with filter paper. Think like a coffee filter. Um, the ones that we use in chemistry are usually a lot thicker and nicer than the ones that you use for coffee, um, but they work the same way. The filter paper is inside of the funnel. You would take your mixture and pour it into the filter or into the um, funnel rather. The filter paper is going to catch the solid and the liquid is going to be able to drip through. Um, this process is usually pretty quick. Sometimes you would then take the solid that's left in here and you would maybe put it in an oven to bake out any of the extra water. Sometimes you just let it sit out on the counter. Uh, there's lots of options there. Sometimes we don't care that much. Um, but this is the quickest way to get the solid out of a liquid. Of course, we can manually remove components of the mixture with our hands if that works. Um, a lot of the time we also talk about iron filings being removed with a magnet. Anytime you are going to separate the components of a mixture, it's important to keep in mind the physical properties of those components. That's all I have for you for today. There are plenty of ways to separate mixtures. This was just six that I find are most commonly used in high school chemistry labs or early college chemistry labs. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below the video. Subscribe so you don't miss the next lesson and I'll see you there. Bye.